me hit record and make sure that's working and uh, it sure. says, says it is. And, um, you know, let me, let me start off with, with asking you, and what was your impression when I, when I emailed that map to you? My initial impression was um, it was, it looked like a map that I had seen. Um, and the map from 1918 and the one from 1935 looked pretty similar. Um, I was really struck at the detail of it. Um, without having looked any further into it, I, I assumed that it had been done by somebody obviously with a architecture or background or an engineering background or, may, or maybe a civic engineer, um, just be, the detail of what was on the map. I mean, it really is incredibly intricate in what it lays out, whether it's the manufacturing districts. And then obviously the, the thing that stands out, I think the most are, are those ethnic neighborhoods, which to me wasn't necessarily shocking considering, but I think to see it illustrated just how clearly delineated those neighborhoods were um it really brought me back to stories i'd heard from my grandparents who lived in um carbondale pennsylvania and in scranton very similar type places to syracuse where there was the irish church two blocks over was the italian church and you didn't go to the italian church you stayed in the irish section so to sort of see that borne out um by what 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 then come to find out is really the sort of an official uh map done by uh, the city engineer i think was really um, just real, a real eye-opening and a really an amazing artifact because I, I had not seen this particular um, type of map before. Yeah, and, and seeing and seeing the words too, uh, you know, yes, yeah. Polish, Irish, German, but then Jewish and Negro and having Negro. it boldly put like this is where this group of people lives. And we as an official city entity recognize that and and essentially, uh, these are our boundaries, everybody, you know? Yeah, that's, you know, and that's the thing too, Matt. I think, you know, the idea that these boundaries were both visible and invisible, uh, that those boundaries were created not by accident, not by some pell-mell um, sort of hodgepodge uh, thing that happened. These were uh, created. There was a force behind them. There was a logic behind them. There was a historical process behind them, particularly when we talk about um, the, the Negro section of the map where the African Americans in Syracuse live. So, I mean, I think that's, and again, I think it's really powerful for folks to see that, um, you know, to, to bring it into full relief um, and then to be able to explain, like, why are those folks living there and why aren't they living anywhere else? Yeah. And, and initially, like you said, it's, it's a practical matter that that uh, if you're coming to the north, you're going to work in a factory job. The factories at that time were still in the center city community. They needed to be able to walk to a factory to get to work. Uh, they couldn't afford much else. They didn't have much money. But then, but then the, that lack of mobility becomes apparent too, doesn't it? Um, socially yeah, it and, and economically. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. I mean, you said you were going to live next to a factory. I mean, let's say if you worked at the Franklin factory, which was at this time, uh, 1919, the largest uh, employer in the city, you probably lived over on the near west side. And if you had the money, you could maybe have taken one of the street railway systems, but otherwise you were probably walking. So you weren't going to be able to be living, you know, up on the north side and working at the Franklin factory. You were going to be living over, um, in, you know, in the Tip Hill Geddes Street area. And the same went for those folks working, you know, in new process gear that would have been living down near the lake and, and those guys up on the north side. So that, that really, you know, it speaks to sort of the, the limited nature of people's lives. People didn't go far from where they lived, from where they worked. Um, even back in 1919. Um, and, you know, and those were white working class folks that maybe had a bit more of an option as opposed to, you know, um, the African-Americans that are living in Syracuse at this time who are really severely limited in both where they can live because of issues like restrictive covenants, which denied African-Americans access to land outside um, and buying homes. And then obviously the process of redlining, which essentially denied African-Americans um, loans to live anywhere outside of restricted areas. So they were, they really were forced to live I'm um, in a place uh, beyond what choice they may have had. And I mean, I think that those harsh historical realities are often lost in the shuffle. You see a map like this and it brings it, um, it really puts it right in your face. So you can really, I think, see it in a much better, more real way. I've got the ability, I think, to, uh, to throw that map up here if I can successfully accomplish some little bit of technology. No, I hear you. The messing around with Zoom is, is something I'm still not very good at. Yeah, no, I, w I had it. I had it. Uh, I think I think this is it here, actually. And so then we can. So can you see that at the same time I'm seeing it now? Or will you maybe in a second? I can. Yep. So uh, let me make it just a little bit bigger, too. You mentioned you mentioned redlining. Uh, you know, the redlining that we've heard 
mostly reported on over, over time refers to the 1937 HOLC maps, the Home Ownership Loan Corporation that was started under FDR. And then, and then yep. we, we have now learned that, that just about every city in the country had a map like that and included redlining, in which, which now means more than just the red lines. But here we are in this map that is at least, you know, it says 1919, and maybe the colors came in a few years later. I guess, we, I don't know if you have any sense of that, but we're seeing red lining on this map. What does that, what does that say to you about what you're looking at here? Well, I think, you know, I, based on the signature on the map, I, I'm confident that uh, Mr. Allen did this in 1919. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I say that because I think that the city had just completed a five-year uh, planning commission. Uh, and, uh, it issued a massive report. So, I mean, 1919 is a really significant year for the city. World War I is over. The Erie Canal is about to be filled in. The Barge Canal is ready to be opened, right? So these are two massive infrastructure changes that are going to drastically alter the face of the city. Um, there were uh, large-scale renovations and expansions done to the city streets, particularly down um, near Onondaga Lake. Um, there had been wide-scale renovations and expansions of the street railway system. So it's not surprising to me that um, Mr. Allen would have gone in and done this as the city engineer. Um, but yeah, I mean, the idea of laying out in stark relief where folks are, and not only that, I mean, the details on this map are truly incredible. I mean, you've just got this issue here map over by the 11th Ward. You've got Gears. You've got the Deets Lanterns Factory there over by Leavenworth Park, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you've got the, there's the tight over by what, you know, Negro, right, here, um, which is actually, I think, spelled uh, somewhat incorrectly, right? you got the typewriter factory, the old L.C. Smith Brothers, you got the steam hat. So, I mean, it, it right. really is this amazing snapshot in time when Syracuse is, at that particular point, one of the truly incredible manufacturing centers anywhere in the country. Um, and it was a place of tremendous opportunity. It's also important when we talk about, you know, the ethnic neighborhoods is that this is a period historians often refer to as the Great Migration, which brought upwards of a million African Americans from the Deep South into cities like Syracuse, Chicago, Detroit, to try and get jobs in those factories. So 1919 was actually a year of significant um, labor unrest in the city, and, and Red Summer involved a lot of actually anti-African American um, attacks uh, at some places, including the Malleable uh, Ironworks, which was off of um, what would be 690 right now. But so cities like Syracuse are having to deal with an influx of, of immigrants, particularly African-American immigrants. And so the process of sort of delineating where they're going to live is something that the cities as municipalities are, are dealing with. And back then, you too, you've got banks are so much more local then, right? The banks are commissioned and, and um, capitalized by local people. So the interplay between the local government, whether it's the city government, the municipal government, or the county government, and those banks is so much more intimate than e it even is today. So the idea that, you know, where uh, certain folks or where certain ethnic groups could live would be dictated um, and then laid out like this on a map um, is, is very easy to understand, um, not so palatable to us, obviously, in 2020. But I mean, so you can really see how that process uh, develops over time to the point where, as you mentioned, once the Federal Housing Authority is, you know, created in, in 1934 as part of the New Deal to bring affordable housing, right, these processes are already in play in a lot of municipalities, so they're essentially ramped up at the federal level. So, so you can really see sort of the evolution uh, of, uh, of the process uh, that, we, that we call redlining. And again, red stands out on a map, so it's, it's stark to the eye. It's, it's very easy to pick up on. Yeah, it really is. And, and uh, in fact, here's the, um, here's that map. I think it's, I think this is the 1937 map or, and here's a different version of it. That's, that's part of the Richmond program now, but, but, you know, as we, as we look at this map from almost 20 years later, we, we get a similar sense. And then, and then back to the map that we're, we're talking about primarily here, uh, that color coding, although the color coding is has a little bit of a different key in 1919, as you said, it's 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 actually technically saying manufacturing was here, but then over in that right column, it also does delineate the blues and the greens, which I think later were inverted that that uh, green was better than blue for some reason. But yeah, citizens of more that. than citizens of more than ordinary wealth. Yeah. Funny professional men, merchants, clerks. So those are our top two classes. Then, then the yellow is artisans and tradesmen, which then often yep. corresponds to 
an Italian, Polish, Irish, German neighborhood. So still white, but nevertheless newer immigrants. And then, then the red areas, which are checkbox as manufacturing, but also labeled mostly as the Negro communities. Uh, yeah. An interesting layering developing of, of the color coding, the, the actual articulation of ethnic uh, groups, and, and, and then what was going on, as you said, in terms of transitions around, around the area is really, uh, it really is a, a map that says a lot, doesn't it? It, it's, it is. It's fascinating to see. And, you know, one of the things I'm sort of thinking about here as we, as we sit in 2020 and, and the, uh, you know, all of the uh, turmoil around the census reporting, mm -hmm. you know, I'm wondering, you know, how do they get this data? What, did, did the city send folks around? Is this based on the 1910 census data that we had? Right? I, I, because this is right before the census. If, sure. in fact, as I think this map is a product of 1919, um, right before the census of 1920. Um, you know, it, it really, it's, it's, a, it's, it is, it's fascinating to me to have that much, uh, and it is amazing just how this one 2D map can have so much depth of history, of mobility, of, you know, the stories, uh, the ethnicities here, and the way in which uh, they are, they're, they're laid on top of each other, and one of the cool things, you know, is to drive through the city today, and you can see, you can feel the vestiges mm -hmm. of these very stark ethnic neighborhoods, even though very few of these neighborhoods, if any, really with, as you said earlier, the exception really of Tip Hill, have any of this, you know, ethnic identity left. I mean, there's that little stretch on the north side of, of Little Italy, but nothing like this. And I, you know, one of the things I'm also struck by is, so we're, here we are in the 15th Ward, there, you know, and down yeah. into the 18th Ward, which is labeled the Jewish section. Yeah. Uh, I've spoken to a few uh, African American folks uh, who grew up in the 15th Ward. So, so that little strip there where it says Negro, uh, where basically mm -hmm. underneath the Italian section, yeah. um, right above the 15th Ward, those houses were incredibly old. We've got some pictures of those, um, you know, around this period. And these were, I mean, substandard is, is making it sound like the club mad. These were not, you know, really nice homes. Back then, they would have called them slums. And so those folks that are that are living there are eventually going to be pushed as the population increases as part of that great migration are going to be pushed into the 15th ward. So the 15th ward is actually this really incredible sort of polygot community. Um, you know, I had a, the, the daughter of a gentleman who was the butcher at Shores Meat Market, mm. which was part of the old 15th ward. And and I she came to see a talk that I gave and in the audience were several uh, elderly African-American folks, some in their eighties. And they remember her father and they would go into shores mm. and they would, and he would give them, you know, like samples and stuff like that. So, you know, in this city that is really segregated, I mean, this map lays it not only by color, but by race, you know, in the 15th ward, you have this, this real mixing of cultures. Um, and I mean, it was referred to by most of the inhabitants at the time as, as Jewtown, because that's where the Jewish people lived. And as the Jewish folks leave in the 20s and the 30s, the African-American population of that particular section of the city grows to the point where essentially by 1960 and urban renewal, you've got about 90% of the city's African-American population living in this area that had one point been the Jewish neighborhood. So you see a real turnover there. And, you know, that's the story of a lot of these neighborhoods. But, uh, but the 15th Ward, of course, is important because it's obliterated to make way for Route 81. Yeah, and, and not just Route 81, but also uh, the Presidential Plaza developments, the Public Safety Building, uh, the Everson Museum. And, the Everson and, Museum, I mean, yep. this, this map is also interesting. Uh, who would have thought that a city had a street called Orange in it next to Grape Street between Almond right. and State and, and with the Syracuse Orange men or Syracuse Orange sports that we got rid of the street labeled Orange. But apparently that's what happened. And, and you're right that these neighborhoods, right, right in this 15th Ward where the label says Jewish what had become a mix by the 50s and the 60s. And, and, and a lot of what you read in the newspaper accounts from the time and, and other reports are, you know, that this was called the Near East Side, which is a phrase we don't even use anymore. Uh, no, we don't. That, that first part of urban renewal was the Near East Side Urban Renewal Initiative, exactly. And I mean, it wiped out uh, the whole neighborhoods, whole swaths. And, you know, back to what you had mentioned earlier, Matt, too, about the 30s map, that 37 map is Syracuse is really um, on the vanguard of that public housing movement in the New Deal. And so right here, smack dab in the middle of the 15th Ward would have been um, the Pioneer Homes development, which is what's, of course, um, built in, you know, in the mid 1930s to uh, provide affordable housing um, for people that didn't have it. So, you know, Syracuse was really on the cutting edge 
um, back then of these new federal programs to try and alleviate some of that poverty um, and some of those housing developments in these neighborhoods. Um, yeah, and afford, and, yeah, go ahead. No, that, that is interesting. And I know that, that uh, let me just click back to, to the, just the video yeah, here if I can, because um, I'm getting too much going on at the same time. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If I can, if I can even, okay, I'll stop sharing. There we go. Um, yes, that, that the, the 1919 map doesn't show the projects. And then in, in the early thirties, mid thirties, that's when those were built. Do you, are you aware, were, were there any restrictions on who could live there? Was that race oriented or was it, were you allowed to live there regardless of race? Was it poverty it only? Pioneer, the Pioneer homes as were built again under sort of the federal regulations, it wasn't ever a, uh, let's say explicit. Sometimes we talk about de jure, desegregation, de facto yes. segregation. Yes. It would have been one of those situations where you would have applied to get into those housing projects and based on income levels and other things, which may or may not have been um, even known to the people that were applying, uh, you would have been granted um, access to those, to those houses. Uh, this is one of the sort of the, 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 the great underbellies or the dark side of those New Deal programs is that while they weren't explicitly um, racist, they had very racial outcomes that were w much more um, devastating to African-American families because these housing projects were built in cities like Syracuse and in what had been known as like, like slum clearance zones in the 1930s. Um, to build these beautiful, I mean, the pioneer homes were designed by King and King architects. I mean, they were really a beautiful places uh, for the period. Um, but no, so it's, it's, it's hard to say. I don't know of any African-American families uh, living there um, in the 30s when the houses were built. Um, I would have been surprised. Um, most of the African-American families that had been living um, in that area where the pioneer homes were built were sort of pushed to the margins of that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and we're put into and you continually substandard housing, uh, which again, substandard is, is really putting in mildly based on some of the photographs I've seen of the, of the houses that should have been condemned, you know, in the 20s and 30s that were still up in the 50s. I mean, really rough, right. rough and, stuff. And, and no, uh, no capital to invest in your home or, or the landlord didn't bother or whatever the situation might have been, right? I mean, they just kept falling. Exactly. And the, and the city, you know, one of the things that pioneers and reformers are, are trying to bring up back then is the city's code enforcement. You know, the city need, had to take a bigger uh, role in going into these places and forcing landlords to pick up property to make sure that things were being taken care of, that people weren't stringing electric wires through three different houses causing, you know, fires and things like that, which were really commonplace in these neighborhoods back in the teens and 20s. And then when the depression hit, obviously all bets were off. You know, and, and we, we looked at 1919, then we get to the 1937 maps and then the, the loan programs and the FHA and, and, and the millions of people across America, families who had a chance to buy a home and create the American dream, new yeah. homes on the edge of cities, suburbs, new schools, but not everybody was included. Uh, yeah, and not everyone was happened included. in Syracuse, right? Yeah, that, and that really is the story of, you know, the post-war dream for a lot of folks, you know, in their 50s and 60s and 70s who grew up in the 50s, uh, particularly in a place like Syracuse. I mean, you look at those pictures of Salina Street in the heyday, uh, this place was humming, you know, it had a higher than standard, um, you know, average income. It was a Nielsen test community. It was a, a test community for products. People in Syracuse lived very well, um, and those uh, proliferation of suburbs, um, you know, did great for those folks. And unfortunately, it also is, is uh, at the same time, what you have is this process of basically de-urbanization, what is sometimes referred to as white flight. Um, we talked earlier about urban renewal and the clearing away of, you know, old buildings, but that had a very, you know, real um, human toll as well. And then what you end up seeing happening is just the reverse. One of the ideas behind the, you know, urban renewal um, and Route 81 and, the, and 690 was that it was going to breathe vibrancy back in to the city of Syracuse. And what ended up happening was just the opposite. The factories that were at that point, I mean, some of these factories, you know, the Brown Lake Chapin factory, the Franklin factory, you know, these factories were built um, at the turn of the century. They're decaying, they're old. So those factories moved out to where their workers did, to DeWitt, to Fayetteville, mm -hmm. right, um, out yeah. that way. So what was left in the city were either people who lived there by choice, and that wasn't, you know, a lot of folks back then, but it was people who had no other place to go. 
again, not because they didn't want to go somewhere else, but because they literally couldn't get a loan to move somewhere. Um, and one of the, you know, one of the things I think is worth uh, talking about, and I'll certainly can send this to you uh, for you to peruse sure. at your leisure, um, was a uh, core, the Congress of Racial Equality had a chapter here in Syracuse that was yeah. founded in 1961. In 1964, um, they put together an incredible document called Project 101. Mm -hmm. And essentially it laid out a hundred um, and one policy proposals to try to deal with the interconnected problems of racial segregation, employment discrimination, housing segregation, and, and educational segregation, which really had led to um, tens of thousands of people, mostly African American, but also, you know, some uh, just poor um, other ethnicities, poor white folks living in these left, basically people that were left behind by that great post-war boom. Um, you know, and I think that oftentimes that those stories are forgotten because people aren't here, sort of out of sight, out of mind. The, you know, people tell me stories all the time about going into Salina Street to shop for Christmas, going to Day Brothers Tea Room and Addis Brothers and, and, you know, hanging out down there, going to, you know, the, the bookstore there, economy bookstore. That stuff basically stops by the 70s. And, you know, if you ask anybody that was in Syracuse to go to Armory Square in the late 1970s, 1980s, they weren't going to be hanging around there, right? Right. So everyone's out in the shopping malls, kill downtown. So, so it really is this sort of uh, unintended consequences, certainly, I think, for the folks that thought it would breathe life in the city, and then all sides of other unintended consequences too, for, certainly for the for the thousands of African American uh, families in Syracuse that are essentially forced into an even smaller ghetto. Um, Ninety percent of the black population is living, you know, in a series of just a few blocks over here on the south side. And again, that that's not an accident. That's that's a historical process at play. Um, policy decisions made by elected officials um, in conjunction with bankers. Um, and again, so some 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 folks got to live the American dream and and uh, a lot of other folks did not have that opportunity. And and here we are uh, about five years now since that the study was collated by the uh, Paul Jaworski down in, in at Rutgers uh, saying that Syracuse was leading the country in concentrated poverty for African Americans and Hispanics now, and and not doing that well for poor whites either in terms of concentrated poverty. Uh, but but he came up here and I walked some of these neighborhoods with him and he could look at building. He, he's like, this is exactly what I would expect to see. You know that that as you're just describing, older buildings falling apart, boarded up, signs of weeds growing. So we you know that one's been unused for some period of time. And, and the very processes that started back in World War I, uh, Depression yeah. era, still are lingering, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, and they're, I'd say more than lingering. They are, I mean, they are omnipresent. They are here with us. I mean, you drive down the south side, the near west side, you can look at an Italian aid home that was clearly built in the 1860s. It's maybe been sided over, but that house inside is built with stuff literally built during the Civil War or maybe just a few years after. Um, and families are living there. I mean, you go by, you know, anyone, a lot of those streets down, down in those neighborhoods. And it's appalling. I mean, you know, it's, it's appalling to think that there are people living there. And if people aren't living there, those homes are, you know, um, places for crime. I mean, one of the things, you know, the, the land bank is doing a great job of trying to get some of those properties there but yeah i mean it's really important for certainly for myself as a historian to to make sure that you know this is not a these are not stories of um you know people making choices to to live this way i mean there are decades in fact centuries of historical processes acting on people right that limit severely their choices i mean when you talked about schools yeah you, you know you make a decision to move to a neighborhood maybe you have kids you want to have them go to a good school if you're born into poverty third generation um on the city south side i don't care what color you are you're going to go to a bad school you're going to be uh, there's going to be higher crime rates more poverty your chances of success are statistically limited so as you said when you walked around with the professor from Rutgers this is you know he's not surprised he's he's right outside Newark he sees this stuff every day and so these these what at one time were these glowing 
on glistening neighborhoods, these beautiful, large Victorian homes that are now subdivided into nine, 10 apartments. You know, um, these schools that were, a lot of them built during the Great Depression as WPA projects that are now 100 years old, right? I mean, you know, these are the, the legacies of what at one time were, were tremendous programs that put people to work, that got people out of poverty, uh, that tried to build affordable housing. Sure, there were a lot of unintended consequences, but, you know, I think it's important for, for historians and, and, and people that are looking at the past to say, this is what happened then. Can we look at it and can we grow? Can we use it to make better policy decisions in the future? Um, and I think that's something that I know a lot of activists and a lot of professors and a lot of social uh, workers here in the city are thinking about, particularly when we talk about something like the Route 81 project. Um, you know, it very, very, very rarely do you get a do over, mm -hmm. uh, you know, both in your life or as a municipality. And in many respects, there's a chance to really get a do over with the Route 81 viaduct uh, project. And so I think, you know, it, it reminds me, you know, we're mentioning the 30s, you know, one of the one of the things that also severely affected um, populations in the city in the 30s was the Great Cross. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Henry Allen, who was the commissioner that made the map that we were looking at, is on the city's grade uh, commission, you know. So that, uh, you know, was, was also in incredibly important to the growth of the city, to moving folks around, right? And those same discussions that were had when it was decided to pull the railroad tracks up out of the middle of the street, you could, Matt, you could pull them and put them on the newspaper today and it would be the same thing, yeah. just insert Route 81 instead of the New York Central Railroad. Yeah. I mean, it really, so, you know, those things as a historian get frustrating when you see people sort of spinning their wheels. So, um, but you know, the more things change, the more they say the shame, it's a cliche for a reason. You mentioned schools, and that, that to me has really stood out as I've dug into this more. You mentioned the old buildings, uh, and, and Syracuse School District right now, I, I just look, is 22% uh, white. I think it's uh, combined 88% black and Hispanic, uh, and it's about half black and then Hispanic and then, and then white, and then obviously some other groups too. But it, it is essentially uh, a segregated school district. Um, and maybe it, maybe it is de facto, I guess, or is it? Yeah. And that's a legal question. Um, but you talk about choices, you know, Syracuse was aware of, of decisions like Brown versus the board of, uh, board of education to be a Kansas, but then also I just was listening to it's Milliken versus Bradley, Michigan comes before the Supreme court in 1974 and the court has the chance to say, uh, Detroit, your, your city school system is 80% African American. We don't think that's right. And the suburban areas uh, are, are almost 100% white. And we want to create a metropolitan school system. And even the federal courts in Michigan had said they're ready to go forward with it. And then the Supreme Court said, nope, we're not going to do it because it's not the fault of the people that are out in those white suburbs that the inner city schools are are segregated right. and what if that is one vote different you wonder and, you know and that's what would how what other path would that have changed the syracuses and others that really were dealing with similar issues yeah you know that's one of the great questions you know i will often you know pose to students on this issue of of you know especially if you have some, I mean, students are getting younger, but, you know, if your parents were going to school in the 60s and 70s, or, I mean, you are of an age where, you know, you were in the suburbs, but the yeah. issue of busing, you know, yeah. is, is one of the most heated yeah. issues of the 60s and 70s. And, I mean, Joe Biden is running for president right now, and he has to answer questions based on his stance on busing as, as a, you know, as a, as a senator from Delaware and Wilmington, obviously, a, you know, a, a heavily um, you know, uh, minority school district in terms of they're the majority there, you know, so he's got things to deal with. But busing was a, it was an incredibly charged issue. And I mean, here in Syracuse was certainly no different. Um, the idea of putting kids on school buses and, and shipping them around the city, um, you know, both black and white students was something that most parents did not want to do. And then, I mean, that's just the logistics of it. And then let's, you know, face the human aspect of the of the racism that's, you know, inherent in a lot of this stuff, you know, being the only uh, black student or two black students in a school yeah. of mostly whites or vice versa, you know, is, is a difficult thing for children. Um, you know, and I mean, you can see the Supreme Court, uh, in, you know, in that decision talking about that idea of school choice, that it isn't, you know, you, people shouldn't be punished 
for you know their decisions to live somewhere else. So it's it's obviously it's an incredibly weighted subject. Um, but yeah, I mean that issue of how much I guess it, from a historian's perspective is how much control should the federal government have on trying to make uh, outcomes more equitable, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, something that is certainly never going to go away. It's one of the sort of great um, questions of, of American history. And when we talk about something like this, uh, you know, people are obviously you know, very protective of their ch children and, and want to give their children everything. That's a human desire, regardless of where you're from or what, what your last name is or what your skin looks like. And so I think that's a very difficult thing. And I think that's probably why, you know, that's usually why we talk about the court sidestepping that issue. But, you know, it, it just, I think it's important to to point out, you know, is that those school districts, what happens is the historical processes again, is that those students have a much harder time um, getting out of those. I mean, I spent a year as an NSF fellow teaching in the city schools here in Syracuse. And I come from a lily white suburban place in Vestal, New York. Um, I went to Binghamton University. Um, I went to Syracuse University for my undergraduate, you know. Uh, so let me tell you, that was an eye opening experience to say the least, mm -hmm. to see what these kids have to deal with um, to see that first of all, school is so much more than school um, in the, in these communities in these poor communities where school is a social worker, school is a food source. Um, kids are at school for, you know, eight, nine hours a day. Um, you know, I think, and again, and then you sit and you think, why is it this way? Right. And that's where we, so the things we've been talking about. Um, this is why it's this way. This, these are, these are the end results of decades of decisions being made by policymakers and by individuals and by banks um, and, you know, by states and the federal government um, that have given us the, you know, these communities. And, and it's going to take a lot of structural change to make up for that. I mean, you can't undo, you know, 150 years of uh, second class citizenship or even, you know, even let's take urban renewal and, and uh, you know, the busing and school segregation, as you said, Syracuse City School District is still a segregated school district. It is, yeah. you know, just yeah. by definition. Uh, so, you know, and, and how do you fix that? It's, 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 it's a very difficult thing to do. I, you, I don't think that most Americans would say we're going to uh, submit to the government telling us where we can live. Um, you know, it sort of reminds me of the debate right now with the police in Syracuse, right? Mm -hmm. Can you force the police to live in Syracuse? Right. I, I don't know. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very interesting philosophical question that I would love to speak on forever. But, you know, these are, these are real, you know, these are real issues with real results and, um, you know, the history behind why you need to maybe have these conversations is something that, you know, is we really are, need to bring up more, I think, as a community. I'm just going to stop the recording.